when you show up to the next day like, hello, my name is Merritt, I'm a monster, right? Until you're there and, and, and you're like, I'm capable of bad stuff at any moment in time. For me, I had to get there and 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 almost embrace a, a bad part of myself, which sounds weird because, you know, we always want to correct the bad, right? This is something that I think will always be lurking under the surface for me, no matter how I work on my belief systems and whatever. It can happen. It can flare up. So the best thing for me is to simply admit it and put my ego aside and embrace that, hey, I've got a real flaw here and therefore I'm going to respect it, right? What I'm really talking about here is rewiring underlying belief systems. You've got to change the way you think about the game. There's this culture of around, around you you can't learn anything from, from a coach or mentor or any of these kind of things. And it's the most utter garbage I've ever heard in my life. It's 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 really ridiculous. And you know, name one other field where that, that is the predominant culture. I've only ever seen it in trading. Greatest things on the planet just simply don't happen in isolation, especially when it comes to performance type stuff. Welcome to the Alpha Mind Podcast, where we explore the psychological, behavioral and mental aspects of trading and investing. My name is Stephen Goldstein. I spent almost 25 years working in the markets as a trader at some of the world's leading investment banks. Since 2010, I've worked as a performance coach with traders and investment specialists, and as an executive coach with leaders and managers, helping them to make powerful transformations in the challenges they face in the markets, in their work and in their world. And my name is Mark Randall. I spent nearly four decades in markets starting in the early 1980s and working most of my career for the NatWest, RBS and Greenwich Capital organizations. I now work as an executive coach and mindset performance coach, helping traders and senior managers to develop optimal mindsets for exceptional performance. Welcome to our show and welcome to today's special guest, Merritt Black. Merritt was one of our early guests back in 2019 and his chat with us proved hugely popular, remaining until very recently our most downloaded episode. This latest episode is so full of nuggets of wisdom from Merritt that there were so many outtakes which we considered using for the one minute intro slot that they themselves could have been an entire episode on their own. Before we go into that episode, we want to first tell you a little bit about the coaching programs we offer to traders and investment specialists lists, both retail and organizational. Our programs are the Trader Performance Coaching Program and the Peak Performance Trading Program. The Trader Performance Coaching Program is based on coaching work we have been doing with traders over the past 10 years inside investment banks, hedge funds, commodity and energy trading firms, asset management businesses, as well as with private and retail traders. Coaching focuses on the person behind the trader and works with them by holistically looking at all aspects of their trading performance to help them make sense of where and how they can optimize how they are and develop an ideal state in relation to their risk behaviors, risk processes, and risk practices so that they can bring the very best of themselves to their work for better and more optimal performance and improve results. The Peak Performance Trading Program focuses more specifically on trader mindset and developing the inner game for trading when facing complex and volatile trading environments. The program uses techniques and methods to build a toolkit of assets to optimize your trader self, heighten your market's awareness, develop your trader edge, and become resilient to market shocks. The program aims to cultivate optimal levels of peak performance on a more consistent basis. You can find out more about these programs by going to the AlphaMind blog page and going to the page links for the two coaching programs at the top of that page. You can find the AlphaMind blog at alphamindblog.blogspot.com or simply by Googling AlphaMind blog. Alternatively, email us at info at alpha-mind.net or simply DMing AlphaMind101 or AlphaMind102 on Twitter. Before we go to this episode, a quick word about our podcast sponsor, the Society of technical analysts, the STA, and their market-leading and industry-recognized home study course. Mark, perhaps you could start by explaining why we opted to work with the STA. Of course, yes. The STA are, are one of the world's oldest professional bodies for the advancement of technical analysis and provide industry-recognized technical analysis education. They are a powerful partner for the Alpha Mind project to be aligned to. They are recognized at a professional level globally and inspire even ourselves as to their thought leadership. They are non-profit and reinvest their income to enhance their services to members. Both myself and Steve have been STA members for many years and and Steve has also been uh, a lecturer on their Diploma One program, I think, haven't you, Steve? 
Uh, yeah, yeah. I've been uh, I've been um, a lecturer in the uh, diploma program, which is taught at the London School of Economics. And yes, it's uh, it's an outstanding program. It's written by some of the leading lights in the field of technical analysis, and many of the alumni of the program have gone on to work at leading trading and investment businesses, as well as in other careers such as financial journalism. And the the home study course is an online version of the uh, of the training program, which goes into the diploma program. And you can also actually qualify for the STA diploma through the home study course by adding it on as an extra feature. And the great thing is that the STA have enabled listeners of the Alpha Mind podcast to gain access to this high quality program at a discounted price. Mark, could you tell them about that? Yes, uh, you can find out more about the home study course and the home study course and diploma package by going to the page link on our blog, uh, alphamindblog.blogspot.com or simply Googling Alpha Mind blog. Now, without further ado, on with this week's podcast. Welcome to this week's Alpha Mind podcast, and we are delighted to have our first returner as a guest, Merritt Black, whose first podcast back in 2019 was hugely popular, and until very recently, when he was knocked off the top by Tom Canfield, was our most downloaded episode. But uh, Tom has done a great job in, uh, in dethroning you. Yeah, I think Tom is not going to have any excuses this year to join a little <laughs> traders golf tournament that we have, so I will put it right back to him. Uh, over there. I'm coming for you, Tom. Okay, he's on his way. Merritt's on his way. But um, yeah, I, I, I got a few feelers for that uh, that event as well, by the way, in Florida. Um, sent it out to me. I don't know if I'll be able to make it, but uh, I'm not really a golfer, but I'm always good in the 19th hole. So uh... <laughs> well, there's plenty of that. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, it's, it's great to have you back, Merritt. And um, maybe you can just um, tell our audience what you're up to these days, what's happened for you, what's changed recently. Sure. Um, I have started my own firm, which I guess is is no no small issue. So Apteros Trading. Um, it's it's kind of this, you know, I picture it as this funnel where there's people out there, and you know, with the ad not the advent, but the coming of age of uh, Robin Hood and trading and GameStop and crypto and all these things. I think trading is a it's so much more of a mainstream, it feels like, um, space. No longer do you get these blank... Remember back in the day, someone said, what do you do? And you say, oh, I'm a trader or whatever, and you get that blank stare. Guess what, guys? That's not a thing anymore. You're like, you're a rock star. Everyone thinks you're the coolest person they've ever met. <laughs> oh, you you trade? Oh, yeah, I did this or that or that, you know? So um, it's that's changed, if you want to know what's different. Um, but yeah, so the way I picture Apteros is really this thing where there's all these people... And my goodness, do they need help, right? And we're one of the good guys. So my hope is that we get this funnel of people who come in. We can help educate them. We can help train them. um, And we can give them a equal employment opportunity to join the desk. Um, And so we've got seven traders now uh, from, you know, Europe to the U.S. um, And we're having a blast. We just, it's so important to be able to, I mean, this day and age, COVID era and everything, to have these these pods or teams or whatnot that, that, that people can be a part of rather than just sitting there alone as trading has always been, a, you know, a challenge and whatnot. So that's what we have going on, training, backing, all that good stuff. Um, just loving what we do every day. Terrific, terrific. And actually, you've reminded me, I had um, somebody on Twitter who, he said he's new to trading and, he, and, and obviously he wants to be highly profitable. Um, just thought that was quite ironic that he said that because I thought that kind of becomes <laughs> as long as default. there's the right expectations for that. Yeah. Yes, yes, and yeah. time but horizons. He, he said, should he try and learn on his own or should he join a prop firm? Um, and if so, can you recommend any? Well, if he's listening to this, uh, we're already hearing about one here and now. Sure. But um, the rise of the prop firm as as they've always been there, but they've taken on a new angle. Um, that, that they're different these days. So maybe you could um, tell people what the benefits are of joining a prop firm. Yeah. What some of the drawbacks may be. I guess you know, with all these things, a lot of people yeah. tell me they 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 apply to many, but they don't get in. Of course. Um, with some, and then of course there's the cost of it. There's a, there's a commitment to yep. joining a prop firm. Yep. So maybe, maybe you could, this is a chance for you to just tell people, you know, what are the ups and downs and the, the positives and negatives of joining a prop firm. 
Yeah, I, I think, you know, not unlike anything else, whatever this person you're speaking of here, whatever life experiences they have, uh, whatever ways they found success, that very rarely, okay, obviously there's the uh, the Mozarts of the world or whatever, but I, um, I'm i not an expert on them, but you kind of think of them as kind of like isolated people, you know, who just have this genius and, and this type of stuff. Trading and other performance activities are, are pretty much not that, okay, so being able to step into a team environment with peers where there's overarching a senior trader who's been there who has experience who can foster your development okay uh, that's that's someone who can actually look over your shoulder and see a decision that you made perhaps even in real time as I do with my traders i told my traders the other day i said in fact, I drew out where this is all remote, right? We're on a Discord server. It's all remote, all over the world. I drew out a seating chart. I said, Kimberly, you sit here. You know, Mike, you sit here. And I, I told people, think, really, really think of it like we're leaning back in our chairs and talking to each other. And by the way, I will drop by and I will tap you on the shoulder and I will ask, Tell me about this position you're in. Why are you doing this? Did you consider that? Is this a good idea? Talk to me about your risk. Talk to me about what's the plan here. So to have that type of development and feedback from someone who has been in your shoes uh, is it, just huge. You, you, you're never going to get that from a book. You're never going to get that from – look, I'm someone who has online courses. You're never going to get that from an online course. So – that type of development is truly, I think, the biggest benefit to a prop desk. Are there is there more leverage, right? Maybe you don't have the capital, so you can you can access capital. We all know, you 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 know as good as any, that the one of the biggest inhibitors to success of trading is being undercapitalized, right? You you think you're just gonna fund a, a, a twenty five hundred dollar account and you're gonna be good to go and you know start making six figures within the next year or two. It's very, 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 very unlikely, right? So that's important, the team environment, the capital, also reduced costs. Um we have a very low, low, low um fee structure in terms of what do you have to pay in terms of commissions and you know access to seats on exchanges and all those type things. Because that type of stuff really adds up. If you're paying, you know, several, several dollars a trade, we can get that more in this the cents per trade, um, you know. So that's a big deal as well as keeping costs low and, 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 and whatnot. So off the top of my head, those are some of the biggest benefits. Starting first and foremost with the environment you're putting yourself in. Being a professional, you know. You, you want to be highly profitable, they said, right? Well, you're going to have to be a professional in order to achieve that. You're not going to be able to weekend warrior your way uh, to that what you said there was fantastic and it really struck me on uh, uh, this point about the learning environment sure. I mean, that is huge i mean it, it, it's it's like going to college and getting a full-blown education or worse <laughs> or, or worse but i mean it, it, you but you get mentoring as well you sure. get you know I, I i often tell people what's the greatest edge you can have in trading and it's mentoring it's not knowing where the market's going. It's not having some super system. You know, it's not having lots of money to start with or capital. It is mentoring. And and when I see traders who have come through and made a success of it, often they've had some great mentors early in their life. Yeah, there's there's not been a uh I don't know a successful trader who 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 can't can't point towards that. It, and so that, I think, <laughs> speaks uh, volumes uh, towards that. I mean, you know, not to get on the kick, I think it's been well discussed uh, a lot, but I mean, I'm really into um, chess, and I have a chess coach. He's way better than me. He can show me mistakes I make. He can, you know, help me in terms of a training plan. Um, and the same goes for, you know, I'm into golf. I, I have all kind. I mean, I, I'm constantly videoing my swing i bring a tripod to the driving range you know i have a coach uh who reviews that video with me and and provides me drills and and things to to make corrections along the way and whatnot i mean it's it's i to me it's common sense but quite frankly the trading community is a little bit um backwards and and uh 
because of all the guys with stacks of money in front of Lamborghinis, there's this culture of around, around you you can't learn anything from, from a coach or mentor or any of these kind of things. And it's the most utter garbage I've ever heard in my life. It's 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 really ridiculous. And you know, name one other field where that, that is the predominant culture. I've only ever seen it in trading. Learning from those who've been before you who can help guide you and show you the ropes and help you learn more about yourself, help you refine a methodology, help you tighten up risk, help you see things the way you, you wouldn't have seen before. It's all invaluable stuff, and, and, and you don't get that on your own in isolation. You're, you're fighting um, a kind of, let's say, a culture of get rich quick. Sure. And you've got a enormous array of people selling something out there. Right. Predatory. You know, yeah. Yeah. Brokers want, you know, they need, for want of a better word, they need um, uh, cannon fodder. Mm-hmm. You know, they need, their models are print, you know, based on getting lots of people in, lots of business going through their books. They don't really care whether you're good enough or not. They just want you coming in. And I'm not talking about professional brokers. And I apologize to anyone who thinks I may be. I know there's some great brokers out there and I've worked oh, with them. Oh, of course. You know, but there, there's a lot of um, of dodgy brokers out there. There's a lot of dodgy trainers selling training courses. There's a lot of people selling systems that are un, unproven. They've, they've, you know, they're training, they're selling those systems. And they need business as quickly as possible. They need to print tickets um, for their sales. And... They will tell you know. No one's going to say that this is really hard. <laughs> you need to take years to learn before you're going to become any good, because you're just not going to sign up. A lot of people, you know, yeah, they want you I, in now. I, I think there's a lot of, it, at least in in the community that I've built and and of other uh, let's say trading educators out there who are very well respected. There's a lot of smart people out there, right? There's it's not all cannon fodder or whatnot. It's uh. There's people who see through that, and those are the type of people that myself and and other really reputable people attract in their doors to 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 simply help and and hope hope that they can take them to that level they want to be at. But that, that's why we talk about these things on the Out from Home podcast. You know, myself and Mark when we originally met, you know, we, we, there was something you know slightly altruistic about our conversation. That there's a lot of young people out there, a lot of very smart people, a lot of very good people. But uh, they're being sold a lot of bad material and bad education. It reminds education. me of our uh, tryout process, right? So we have a, a an open tryout where anyone in the world can it can pay us because it takes money to run it and administer it and all this stuff to try out to earn a seat on our desk. That is the only way onto our desk. And for me, it's altruistic. It's where I came from. Um, you know, not a, a wealthy family, middle of nowhere, blah, blah, blah. No uncles who did it, no parents who were financially, you know, savvy, none of that stuff. And I have found amazing people out there in Eastern Europe, you know, um, Canada, uh, Latin America, Asia, all over the place who just have that drive. And that's an opportunity for them that I feel that, that I am offering to the world that they, anyone, no matter what's on your resume, no matter where you went to school, no matter who you know, it's black and white. You can make it in. Just show us, right? But there's so many others out there who run that as a pure business model, who are essentially feeding off that get-rich-quick hopes and dreams of people out there. So, anyways, I don't know if this conversation is the most helpful for for your listeners or whatnot, but uh... <laughs> it does sound slightly negative. But I think we're we're trying to just, I guess, putting a dose of realism because you, you are trying to rebalance that. You know, you've got this prop firm going. Yep. You worked at a great prop firm before, which has got a great reputation. Yep. Um, and between the between your new firm and your old firm, you're doing some great stuff. I know. Um, there's the book, the playbook, which is a brilliant book. I've got it upstairs. I recently ordered it. Um, and it, it, it's all geared towards helping people in this battle where, you know, the odds are against them, but if they're ambitious, sensible, smart, um, uh, they, they can succeed. And, and we're talking about, you know, the importance of mentoring. And, you know, I'd love to bring Mark into it at this point. 
Uh, yeah, for those that listen, I was slightly delayed in the traffic jam before I got here. But um, <clears throat> I think it's super important. What's the difference between normal and, and, and fantastic in the world of sport? You know, there's so many people play around with the... Particularly like um, parents that, that want their fantastic plan football son to suddenly be in the in the A list of league, you know, lined up for for a premier role in future. But of course, they just think, you know, with a bit of normal practice, he can get there. But the difference between normal and and superb behaviour is enormous, and a lot of it's down to commitment and commitment to learn, commitment to change, commitment to actually <clears throat> perhaps understand that the way that you're currently doing things is actually wrong. And a lot of people just won't own up to being wrong. Um, and either in that's their methodology, what they're actually facing as the, as the market's sort of direction in terms of product. Um, and I don't think people ask that question enough. You know, am I actually, am I, not just, am I doing this right? Am I, what, what am I doing wrong? You know, what have I just got as a habit that's just got me into stuck into this behavior? It's very common for me to see people who are extremely stuck on a methodology or, a, you know, a, a, a way of trading that they say, look, I've got an edge. It's just my psychology that's the problem. And I say, okay, let's dive into your edge. Let's talk about it. And, and you explain to me the processes behind it and all this type of stuff. There's no edge there. They 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 don't. They're they're stumbling around in the dark, and they think they have something. And and it's 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 no offense to those people. It's very easy to do. I've I've been there myself, but they really truly don't have a methodology with edge, and therefore they 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 think they have this uphill struggle with psychology, but really they're just not objective about what they're trying to do at all. Sure, and this is sunk cost bias type problem as well, whereby. You know, if, if you oh, yeah. put the effort into crunching and churning and you suddenly got your life's work creates this it's model, baby. right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, how um, how urgent are you going to be looking at changing that having invested so much time in it? How much, how much will you actually criticize it and say, actually, this is just wrong. I've just gone along this journey of assumptions and, you know, Playing in a market that I don't really know the character of, I don't really know the the impact it has on me, really, um, and yet I've put my life work into defining the model, and I'm unwilling to change the model because I'm right, and that's as far as I'm going. I don't want to scrap it and start again, but I think the people need to get the um, get the mindset of understanding that actually there are times when you have to say, I just need to scrap this and throw away all of this work, and actually take a fresh look at this. A, a direct nugget for listeners here would be one of the most common things I've seen is someone – it's very easy to point to places on the chart where your signal, whatever it is that generates a trade idea for you, look, it worked there, it worked there, it worked there. And our our eyes, our brains, and our egos make it very easy for us to find those spots on the chart. But you know what's lurking there that people do not see? are the other 47 places on that chart where the same signal showed up, but it just wasn't a, a top or a bottom, a place with just tremendous risk-reward where it worked, and so they actually fail to see the dark side of, of, of the, the whole methodology and whatnot, which all of them have, but we just have to learn to be hyper-vigilant about our objectivity as we analyze things like that. And do you think that... Moving averages and, and p people looking at moving averages almost becomes a trap for people where they think, oh my God, look at this, look at these things. I've bought there, I've come out there and I'd have done this you know, 20 times in the I last five years, there. a major fortune. Well, you know, we know that in the world of trading, I don't think there is anyone sitting in a hedge fund anywhere that's made an awful lot of money by only just looking at crossovers and moving averages. Otherwise, the whole world will get to be rich. And in reality, right. it's, 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 it doesn't work that way. There's another, there's another point, and I'd love to hear your take on this, um, Merit. It, 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 the really good trades often don't sit on the black or the white, but they sit in the grey in between. And somewhere along the line, you have to yes. learn intuitively when to take those and when to avoid them. And, it, and it's different for each person. 
what I could tell someone exactly the reasons why I think I would take a trade, but it wouldn't work for them because they're not the same person. But they have to find their own ones. They have to take that raw material and then add their own nuance and new edge and, 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 and slightly different spin on it. And that will come with time and practice and uh, and repetition and reflection. Yeah, there's so many topics embedded in, in what you just said. Um, I, I think, first of all, I'll let you know my particular take, right? I don't have all the answers, guys, but I'm here sharing honestly and, and, and giving what I can. Um, number one... I don't think that um, – I'm not a big fan of intuition. Now, I know at the highest levels of any performance activities that we tend to move towards the intuitive. I know that, okay? Um, but I think that traders want to start there, and they have no business starting there. So therefore, I think most times it's very, very bad for most traders traders at home trying to figure this thing out to say, well, I just need to be more intuitive. I wholeheartedly disagree. Um, I think that even for your middle tier performer, someone who's really started to figure some things out and is starting to do well, I think intuition a lot of times is almost like a laziness. It is uh, you haven't thought deeply enough about that intuitive side to then go reverse engineer it and figure out, oh, you know what? Because at the end of the day, we're looking at, it doesn't matter. You could be looking at moon phases. You could be looking at moving averages. You could be a naked price action trader. But whatever you're calling, well, I've got a feeling about this one. I've got intuition on this. I think the work there is to try and figure out where it comes from, from an objective market generated information perspective and try and, and try and make it a variable, try and really learn it so that you can continue to use it. Um, I, I, I think that's very, very important. Uh, another one of my soapboxes is, is discipline. I don't, I, I think the discipline is, is, a, a, almost like a bad word. Um, discipline implies that there's an internal struggle, that there's a fight. And my whole purpose on the psychology side of things with, with my guys is to move them towards a place where they're at peace. They have less reasons to fight themselves. They're not in a battle with the market. They don't, they don't see things that way anymore. So it becomes less about, well, I really, really want to do this, but that's bad. I better not do it. I'm going to be disciplined. Okay? So I think discipline is a very early stage of, of the way I see uh, trader psychology development. Um, and then finally, I think a, a thing you touched on there, which we could talk about all this stuff as much as y'all want. Um, but the, the third thing would be you talked about taking a style, um, making it your own, tweaking, those type things. I think it's critical. I think um, you, you, you first want to start out and be pretty by the book, if you will. And you want to kind of whether it's intuitive or whatever, and you start to dial it in, say, okay, here's some variables. Let me build a playbook, right? Let me define variables for, for a, a, a methodology here. Let me have a risk plan that's written down. I understand what I'm doing. I'm not just winging this. And from there, I think it's very, very important. Anyone who studies my NADRO methodology, it's very framework-based. It's not, well, you see, when the 8-period EMA crosses the 21, you just buy. No. It's here's a framework for understanding kind of a risk reward landscape. Here's how to digest multiple time frames. Here's how to time your trades intraday once you already have an idea or a bias or a long short idea. It's very framework based and some people are very order flow heavy on the short end. Some people are very narrative heavy and want to swing trade. But the point here is make it your own. No matter what you do, start kind of first be unoriginal as Mike Belfiore likes to say. First be unoriginal, and then you begin to get nuanced. Then you become a more of a specialist. Then you, be, you can bring in your own experiences and, and really start to make it your own. Because when you do that, that's where the real magic happens because you, you, you buy into it, you trust it, you believe in it, and that frees you up to perform at a higher level than just trying to uh, mimic something else. But I, I think mimicry 
um, is the place where you want to start. Brilliant. I, I love that. And there was so much you said there, which I'd love to come back sure. on. And I'm sure Mark will as well, but I just want to jump in with a couple of things. Um, what you said about intuition is interesting in light of our conversation with our guest last time, Gerard Tendler, who who's just written a book called The um, uh, the Mental Game of, of Trading. Mm-hmm. Gerard's a mental game coach and, and maybe someone you want to look up, for, also coaches, golfers. Mm-hmm. But um, he, he said about intuition that people confuse it. It's, it's really recognition, not intuition. There you go. And, and you need to go through things so many times and then you start to recognize things in your body. You start to feel them. Your body recognizes them. Your mind recognizes right. and them. And then it's habit and patterns we, and it's, it's who you are. Yeah. It's belief systems. It's ingrained. And then you can call it intuition. <laughs> but yeah, you got it. It's a catch-all word. Yeah. yeah. And then the discipline, but again, I love that. But, but that really thing about fighting yourselves, give yourself less reasons to fight yourself. Mm-hmm. As I always say, it's not the market you overcome, it's yourself. So if you are fighting yourself, you're making the job 100 times harder. You need to be your ally. I, I think that we could, we could just almost distill it down to, there's a million ways, but one way I think it would be easy for us to go here is around expectations. What are your expectations you're placing on the outcome of a trade? Anyone who's been around trading for two weeks knows that we're not supposed to really care that much about the outcome of an individual trade. If we're 40% win percent, if we're 60%, if you're 60% win percent, which is high, by the way, in the world of trading, you're wrong 40% of the time. So... Are you going to get wrapped up in this this expectation of, oh, this is the one, this is a winner, I'm invested in this, and now the market all of a sudden can easily become an adversary, right? And now you need discipline and willpower and all these things because you're in a fight. But if you have the proper belief systems about what the market is, probabilities-based trading thinking, right, you all of a sudden it just frees you up. It frees up your mental your your capacity to focus on the things that actually matter, focus on the things that you can control rather than the outcome of this trade. It's just a simple example. Yeah, yeah next thousand trades, not next one trade. Yeah. That's uh, I think that's something that people need to keep oh, yeah. in their mind as often as possible. Over and over. And, and then there was that last point, and I, again, I'm, I can see Mark, Mark Hitchin to get in there, but there's this, you mentioned something called the NADRO methodology. Mm-hmm. That's something you've come up with? Yeah, it's an acronym for kind of a top-down approach uh, where we start. Uh, so N is for narrative, and, and that starts us out with we use market profile, volume profile, some uh, longer-term VWAPs and whatnot to get a sense of where the market's recently rejected, where it's trying to head to, a.k.a. what is unfolding. We're not predicting, we're not saying this should happen, this will happen. We're saying currently, based on the framework that we understand about narrative, as we call it, not like a fundamental narrative, it's, it's purely technical. Okay, based on the market being able to hold above this reference and this confluence of references, that tells us the market is attempting to work towards this, what we call likely destination. So, that gives us a, a directional bias. That gives us a place where that becomes wrong and the bias changes or goes neutral. So we, we build a narrative framework. And then acceptance, A, in A, is simply, you know, where does a, a line in the sand get crossed, right? Let's say that the market is below a level and we trade up to that level and we cross it by one tick. Are we above the level? What about two ticks? Are we above the level? Or have you gone bullish? You know what I mean? We teach people to see that very differently. We teach people to look at the average rotation sizes that are in markets, and we need to see a market get through on a, a volatility-adjusted basis, if you will, through an area by enough either distance or time to say that we have accepted that level, and now that plays back into what's the current narrative for that. So we have narrative, we have acceptance, we have D, which stands for developing value. I'm all about value, whether it's the higher time frame reads on value, 
whether it's the our trading time frame reads on value. We look at VWAP, we look at standard deviations from VWAP as kind of a value area as it develops throughout the session. And that gives us an intraday framework to either fade edges of a rotational market, one that's going more sideways, if the narrative and the acceptance picture support that idea, or go with what people call a trend, what we call an imbalance for AMT people, auction market theory people, profile people, um, to go with that, again, if the narrative and acceptance picture makes sense. So N-A-D-R is rhythm. Rhythm is just getting a sense for what is that current ebb and flow? What is that average size for your time frame of those rotations, right? FT71, you guys have probably heard of him. Um, he talks about this concept of a harmonic rotation. He actually does like a distribution study of what are the the rotation sizes for a particular time frame. I tend to be a little more dynamic with it. I just look at the past handful of rotations because what's the average of the past six years of rotations? I could care less, okay? Because there's going to be periods of high volatility and low volatility, so I prefer to be more dynamic, okay? So bear with me. We got a narrative big picture idea. We have acceptance, whether we're holding above or below our key lines in the sand for the narrative. We have developing value, which gives us intraday trade locations, if you will, where it makes sense to to pick spots, to get involved in those ideas. And now we're reading rhythm of individual rotations. I don't want people getting in late chasing a move that's already running, right? I want you to get in where it begins to turn, where there's enough of a momentum shift, where there's enough of a pullback, okay, in rhythm. In ADRO, and then the, the, the last person on the totem pole here, the, the least important, but the most immediately impacting is order flow. And so that's where we now look inside the bars. We use things like cumulative delta, footprint charts, to essentially, no matter how you slice and dice it, what we're trying to read with order flow is who's being really aggressive and, and, and where. So are buyers really just grabbing offers? Are sellers really slamming bids? So there's more depth to even looking at a volume profile. Who's being aggressive? Who's impatient? Who's trying to get out? Who's trying to get in? And and that just adds that smallest time frame layer to that complete NADRO picture. And so that's the framework that I teach people. And there's a million ways to go when you when we talked about making it your own. There's a million ways to make that your own whether it's the markets you trade, whether it's the time frames you express those things on, whether you're very short-term, uh, order flow heavy, whether you're more bigger picture, swing trade, narrative ideas. Um, so that's what that's the, that's the elevator pitch for, for NADRA. We will return to the podcast shortly. First, a quick word about our podcast sponsor. This podcast is sponsored by the Society of Technical Analysts, the STA. We are delighted to be able to promote their brilliant STA technical analysis home study course. Listeners to the Alphamon podcast interested in studying for the home study course can get an exclusive discount by visiting the Alphamon blog page where they can find a link to the home study course at the top of the page. Go to alphamonblog.blogspot.com or just Google Alphamon blog. Now back to this week's podcast. Well, I think if anyone is trying to work out how to get ahead in markets and try to understand was this, what does professional thinking around markets look like? They need to replay the last five minutes of this podcast to understand sure. just what curiosity stands for, um, what professionals are really, really looking at in terms of the texture and the depth and the color and the variability of markets. That was in yep. that last five minutes. So if you want a sort of a guide, I mean, that. Nadrosa is is a, is a is a obviously means many things across those various uh, points, but just listen to what was said, and understand that is the level of detail and understanding of markets and directional trading that you need to be involved with, really, if you want to make headway in this very very difficult challenge space called the markets. So, Mary, I think we're super grateful you went through that. But I guess I want to go back to some of the slightly earlier things you said. I think be, be unoriginal is, 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 is such a word. But of course, if you want to make a great trader, you actually need to start off with making a great person to start with. I guess I want to come back to something that 
that, that Steve was talking about, which is about this con- concept of recognition and actually say it's, it's more about awareness. I think you need to have an awareness to understand where to apply curiosity. You need to have an awareness around actually the state of yourself. Uh, and as many people will open this podcast, that, that's what I focus upon. Because if you want to be a great trader, you actually got to take a, a few steps back and actually think, well, what, how can I make myself great and optimal? It's just the state of being. Because if you've got a very wonky platform, very uneven platform, very unstable platform around yourself, then you're not going to cope with things if things get dangerous and complex and demanding. You need to have a very firm base to um, to, to grow from. And so these this is important of course awareness fits into that because you need to be aware of your state if you're in a crap state you walk into the market in a crap state of mind or the, the wrong mindset it's probably not a good thing to do but if you're in a crap state well how do I get myself into a better state to you know approach uh, the market in as in a sort of intricate way as, as Merritt described across the the Nadro sort of principles um, you can't do that if you're in a super stressed state you can't do that if you're just you know being distracted by your own distraction. Um, there are many things that distract us, which we think are distractions, but we can be distracted by just how we didn't manage ourselves yesterday and how we're coming into today with just this this heaviness of just not seeing anything. And I think that can apply to, to any, any performance sort of uh, culture, really. You know, we can have a bad night, wake up and have a bad day. We can have a bad day and dwell on it and it still becomes, you know, the shape of the day we're yet to live because we're so stuck somewhere else. So I think awareness is something that is so significant. And I I think there's multiple, almost as a trader, there's multiple timeframes to this awareness. I think almost all the awareness um, aspects you hit on there are what I would call the higher timeframe type awareness, right? Um, You know, are you, are you, emotionally upset or you know are, are you aware of that as you come into the trading desk like that that's that's important right um what are you did you have a bad session are you carrying that baggage into the next session things like that for me and i totally agree for me most of the time when i'm talking to people about awareness it's it's even on a more uh let's call it lower time frame more granular level are you just clicking the button right are you just sitting there getting into this state that I see so many people where they've been doing this a couple of years and they're sitting in their seat. They're, I'm using air quotes here for the podcast people who can't see. They're trading. They're trading, all right? And, and they're almost flying on this autopilot mode. And these are going to be people who I don't think are ready for fully intuitive, okay, which is most people. We need to insert self-awareness in between whatever idea you have, okay? You get an impulse, whether it's because the market just moved suddenly, whether it's because one of your setups just fired perfectly, whether it's because you did have a um, a bad session last time and now you're thinking something about that bad session, which is going to cause you to maybe take a trading action, okay? doesn't matter where that impulse comes from. If you do not insert self-awareness between that impulse and you getting down to actually clicking the button or hitting the hotkey, you're in for a world of hurt. You have to insert self-awareness. Okay, I'm wanting to make this action. Why is that? You have to just simply ask that. And you have to get back to filtering market-generated information through a process for making decisions. And that, my friends, is what's going to tell you whether or not that idea is a good one or a bad one, whether or not it should be implemented or dismissed. That is the simple model that I preach and preach and preach. You know, it's great hearing you say this. But then we move on to the performance aspect. You know, the the actual, you know, you've got the trade entry criteria, you've set it Mm -hmm. up. And then, you know, this has just had another level of complexity and awareness and and the, the dangers of distraction. You know, how do you get the most bang for your buck once you've got it on? You then have to stay this course. You know, a, a lot of people go through a significant mood change once they're into the trade. Yeah. But why? that goes back to in. that word I was using earlier, expectations. 
if you don't have those expe- wrong expectations, right? Like you have a crystal ball, you know what's going to happen next, what should happen, what needs to happen, what you desperately want to happen. You have to get away from that. And then you can actually sit back. You can actually, I kid you not, you can get to a state where you genuinely don't care about the outcome of that one trade. It is attainable. People think it's like voodoo talk. It's attainable. Am I perfectly always there myself? Not always, but most of the time I am. Most of the time I am. It, it's no it's no different than than um playing golf, you know. If you're going to sit there and have these expectations that you're going to you must hit the perfect shot that there's water on the right that you have to be, you know, cautious of and and you're going to place these expectations. You have to learn to be a good loser before you're ever going to be able to win. You have to accept before a trade, before a golf shot I might shank it in the water and then move on from that and focus on what you do want to do. You have to accept when you put a trade on, it might be a loser. And you have to accept that and focus on what you can control and, and what you can take care of. Now, there's, there's a phrase which I use often with my clients. and Whenever I use it, I see them having a very perplexed look on their face, which is I say, learn to love your losses. Sure. And, and they go, what the hell does that mean? Why would I love my losses? And I tell them my story that, you know, as, as a, when I was a trader, I had this, you know, hate, hate relationship with losses. I hated them, like every trader does at the beginning. And the problem is you get to a point where you hate them so much, you do everything to avoid them. And if you're not going to have them, you're not going to win. Yeah, playing not to you lose know? doesn't work for anybody. Yeah. So you, you just don't take trades. You, you cut losses quickly. You cut profits quickly. You move stops. You do everything that you shouldn't do because of your avoidance of losses. Yep. So I redefined it at some point in my career. I said, do you know what? You've got to learn to love your losses, Steve. That makes them acceptable. That makes them permissible. And that makes them okay. And guess what? I started making more money. Sure. You know, it, it, it is. It, <laughs> it sounds such a paradoxical statement. But it, it really worked for me, and I try and get other people to see that. And I don't mean I don't mean in the pure sense of learning to love your losses. No one loves losing. We'd love to have a hundred percent win. Total rate. acceptance, I think, is 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 where you have to get. Uh, you know, it, it doesn't have to be. You don't have to be giddy with your losses. But uh, again, to me, it comes back to like this cold hard math staring me in the face. If I am a 40% win percent trader, okay? Six out of 10 are losses. So w- how are you going to get around this? You're just going to be a miserable person all day and just hate every, you know, 60% of, of the <laughs> y- these these trades? You're just pissed off? That's insane, you know? If you just stare at the math, you've got to accept it. There's no way around it. It's part of the job. It's It's just, okay, next... The next shot's more important than the last mistake. Like you said earlier on, it's not about the outcome. It's about the, it's about the process. Sure, sure. And, and, and I'm really, what I'm really talking about here is rewiring underlying belief systems. That's what I'm really talking about. You've got to change the way you think about the game. When, I, when everyone gets into trading, they're looking for the secret sauce, the magic indicators, the way to be right more, right? I could care less how often I'm right. For the most part, you know, unless it's just uh, we, we run into real problems. Uh, win percent, you're, you're dropping to zero is a problem. <laughs> um, I'm focused on where there's asymmetry and risk reward in a market. That's really what, you know, nothing about NADRO is about being right more often. It's about aligning yourself where the risk reward is asymmetric, where there is opportunity to make more for the risk that you want to put on, that you need to put on, that you have to put on in order to find out, you know, to kind of quote Mark Douglas, if the next trade is going to be a winner or a loser. No, I think the, um, the you know, the, the odds and the, um, the the dilemma is 
is that if the expectation's wrong, then you're always going to be disappointed with trading, right? You know, I think that uh, there needs to be an expectation that, you know, when you walk off the, the trading floor at the end of the day, you're going to have a book that's most days going to be flat, you know? But there's going to be some horrific days. There's going to be some days that if you haven't got the process and the structure to understand that, a bad trade can suddenly turn into a horrific trade that can suddenly turn into a catastrophic trade. Um, the difference between one extreme and the other is you just need to have have a process, have some sort of lifeboat structure in place that if an event happens, you do certain things to stop you losing your your absolute full worth. Another benefit of being on a, a professional desk, you've got a 24-7 risk team around the world that's looking over your shoulder to help help you with that in case something does go wrong. Indeed, and of course they'll say you've got too much risk there or, or the whole team has skewed in too much of a direction. You need to go underweight. <clears throat> if you're doing it on your own, you kind of have to have a, a sort of a, a, your own guardian angel within the way you think that, that <laughs> sort of taps you on the shoulder and asks you that question. When, you know, when you're at your worst, by the yeah, way. Yeah, well, for yeah. sure. Yeah, you need to call upon that resource. But but then you need to have the awareness of knowing that it's there available because actually if you're at your worst, you're going to forget about all of that. One of the biggest breakthroughs, I think, in my own trading was kind of when I got to the point... I'm a, I'm a bit of a cocky person by, by nature. Uh, just very, very self-confident. You know, just that's just how I've always been. But one of the the biggest breakthroughs was where I got my teeth kicked in just enough times. It took quite a quite a while, but just enough times where. And by the way, it it was typically my fault, right? It was when I was at my worst. I was I was out of line, on tilt, you know, whatever 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 the thing is. When I got to the point where I could kind of realize and call myself a monster, that was where I really started to make a turn for the better but not before then. Before then, it's all about figuring out that methodology and system and moving averages and RSI and stochastics and finding all the, 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 the ways to master the markets. And then you get beat up enough by making so many bad mistakes that um, it wasn't until you kind of find out that, and it, it, for me, admit to myself wholeheartedly, you have a monster inside you. You have this big ego. You need to be right. All of these things that are going to go against a trader. Until you get to the point of admitting that and acknowledging it, like Alcoholics Anonymous type, accepting that and saying that, you know, when you show up to the next day, like, hello, my name is Merritt. I'm a monster, right? Until you're there and, and, and you're like, I'm capable of bad stuff at any moment in time. For me, I had to get there and 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 almost embrace a, a bad part of myself, which sounds weird because you know we always want to correct the bad, right? This is something that I think will always be lurking under the surface for me, no matter how I work on my belief systems and whatever. It can happen; it can flare up. So, the best thing for me is to simply admit it and put my ego aside and embrace that. Hey, I've got a real flaw here, and therefore I'm going to respect it, right? and do things to, to help me do that. So, This point about acceptance is such a crucial part of trading. It's, it's that ability to let go. And to let go, you have to accept that somehow you are flawed. You are not perfect. Yeah. You are capable of making mistakes. You are capable of falling in love with views that's unhealthy. You're capable of being an idiot. Yep. You know? And once you can do that and not blame everyone else and not blame the market and say... Well, maybe I'm wrong. You know, maybe I'm the idiot. You know, we, we used to have a, a term on our, on our trading desk when I worked at one of the banks I worked at. If you don't know who the village idiot is, it's probably you. And, you know, you, you made a huge point about that, that acceptance. And, and trading is a very ego, um, it's not only an egocentric job in that it's just you and no one else. <laughs> you know, you are at the center of it, but it's you against the market. But the market doesn't care about you. Right, so it's not you against the market. No, but the, you think it is. Right, right. But it, the market is like the terrain. Sure. We, we, you know, it, the market has like... the ability to hurt you. The market takes, takes things from you. The market uh, inflicts pain upon you. 
those are all amateur views, though, that, that you have to rewire those belief systems around um, and, and begin to see the market as an endless stream opportunity flow, you know, of, of uh, this neutral has it has no feelings emotions it's not out to get you it you you have to get there it's just it's it's a lot of randomness quite frankly i think accepting the randomness of markets and how at any point in time a news headline could fire off here a um um a bomb could go off there a uh, a big algo could go out of whack and off kilter there a fun could blow up there no one can analyze and prepare for those things therefore there is a large degree of inherent randomness in markets right and that's a that's kind of one another one of those like love your love your losses paradox i'm sitting here telling you that like i can analyze markets and find risk reward and extract profits from it and do these things that i do but i'm also telling you that it's a bunch of jumbled up randomness that you kind of have to like well you know let go of it's tough, yeah. It, it, it is a job full of paradoxes, mm-hmm. you know. It, I mean, the whole time, and it's uh, you know, it's great to hear. It's great for our audience to hear a pro like you talking about this, and you know, sharing these views. You've been around the block a lot. You've fought your own battles. Um, you know, we've had you on before, and you know, because you were such a good talker last time, and our audience loved you, and I think they're going to love this again. I, I just, I. I Genuinely hope it uh, adds value to people that have, because I know I needed it uh, along the way. Yeah, you're going to get hurt. I mean, you have to accept there's an acceptance that you'll be hurt on the journey. Um, and you need to be able to patch yourself up and sometimes take some uh, some rest to get over it. And then oh, absolutely. Kind, of, kind of figure how you're going to get yourself market ready again to, to come back with lessons learned. Um, and knowing that those challenges will come. You know, not accepting that, okay, I'm on a run, it's going to last forever, or I've got this system, it's going to be fantastic, and I don't need to tweak it or put any effort into it. You, you will need to change things. You might need to stop. You might need to totally reinvent yourself. Yep, it could happen to, to anything, in, including the methodology that I teach and the tools that I... In fact, we went through a period there for a while where uh, cumulative delta in particular, this this cumulative measure of volume at the ask minus volume at the bid throughout the session, who, who looks at kind of that aggressiveness of, of participants. Um, I wholeheartedly admitted to all my students, all my traders, everyone, look, this was during 2020 for a while, several months. It doesn't work anymore. It's not working. It is totally out of whack. It's totally discombobulated from all the kind of laws and principles and ways of understanding it that, that, that we've all together as a community and, and everyone, not just myself, have worked towards a deeper and better understanding of using that tool. And so we, you know, you, there's times where you have to just accept that. There's a lot of people who aren't trading anymore who went down with the ship, right? Something worked. It's supposed to work. I'm going to continue to use it. You you have to be able to adapt because markets are dynamic. That's it's not some static thing that once you figure. Look at systems, people. My goodness, right? Quantitative traders, they don't just figure something out and then go to the beach. Markets are going to evolve and change, and they're going to have to make tweaks, and they're going to have to adapt those systems for different volatility conditions. And I mean, you name it. It's it's very very complex, and it's always evolving. Can I can I ask a question? I mean, this is this is great to no. hear it. I, Okay. <laughs> Go ahead, please. No. Quietly. <laughs> no, you've, run, you've done it now. <laughs> um, I, I'm really curious. I, I want to go back to the very beginning, you know, where Mark was stuck in a traffic jam somewhere. Can, admit it, Mark, you were down the pub. Down, the pub, down the pub, exactly. Thank you. Lockdown's Thank over. You. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, Mark, Mark was down the pub rather than stuck in a traffic jam. But at the beginning, we spoke about prop shops and working in a prop firm and the benefits of it. And obviously... Only very few people will be able to work in a prop firm. Um, There's not that many of them around um, compared to the number of traders, so most of them are working from home. This sort of stuff which you're talking about here, how do they get that development and training, in your opinion? How do you develop from home? What what are some of the tools you could use? I mean, obviously, there's chat rooms, there's there's trainers, there's education So these are people who 
are not on a desk, what's the what's the best thing they can do? Yeah. Yeah. I th- it, it depends on where you're at, okay? It depend you know, where are you on the curve? De- it depends on what you need. So I'll try and maybe take it chronologically. First, I think you want to just be a sponge. Just um absorb everything you can from I mean, there is so much good free information out there on understanding markets, understanding different ways of approaching them. Um there amongst all the bad garbage uh, you know have have your filters up right if something doesn't doesn't strike you as honest and and someone who who is has been around or or whatnot and, and is trying to posture too much maybe or or whatever the case i don't know just just you know maybe use some intuition there on on that um there are very very credible people out there putting out fantastic information at no cost okay so you can learn a lot, just soak it up, and then I say go towards what – I think joy in trading is something that's kind of been um, a little bit of a soapbox for me lately. I, um, I've i seen traders lose their joy in trading, and I, I think it's important – I, you know, I'm again. I'm I'm playing golf a lot these days. I, I'm I'm really into it. And most Jordan Spieth is a, one of the most famous golfers in the world. And he went on a huge dry run, huge dry spell. Like wasn't winning. He went from the top to way way down for for a couple of years. He recently won a tournament um, a, a month or so ago, and they asked him about what um, what his mentality had been. You know, coming into Sunday. You know, in in contention and those type things. And he said, you know, I just really wanted to come in with a lightness to me. I just really wanted to, you know, try and try and have fun. And those, I, I used to think that was a little hokey that, that those guys just said that. No, it is not. That is a genuine mentality for someone who has put in all the reps, who has developed very, very consciously and objectively. You can get to a point, and I think you need to stay at a point where you can be light, you can have fun, and someone who's just in a battle with themselves and battle with the market all day is not going to be having that kind of fun. They're impossible. So um, that's a bit of an off topic. So absorb things. Go, But the reason I said that was go in a direction where you think you can have some fun and look at yourself objectively, to overuse that word, Um where have you had success in the past? Has it been very reactive, very quick, very thinking fast? Or has it been slower, deeper, methodical type of thinking? Okay, look at, pick one of those. And I think that tells you a lot about where you are most inclined to have success as a trader. Whether you want to go towards shorter term time frames, scalping, order flow. Whether you want to go more towards slower thinking Longer time frames, swing trading, less trades, longer hold times, right? Which factors into the trade management uh, scheme that you, you you develop. So look at yourself, absorb everything. If you can get on board, figure out how to kind of do that thing where you can adopt something from someone. Look, I mean, like my NADRO methodology, you, th- you think that there, you know, Jim Dalton is not incorporated in, into that? Of course he is, you know? I didn't reinvent the wheel on everything. I took pieces from here and there, and I studied everything I could, and I, I, I went with what I liked and enjoyed and what spoke to me about markets um, and and pieced it together over years and years. Um, so that's the process I went through. That's that, you know, I didn't, I didn't, um, I didn't do a good enough job of this next thing that I'll say, which is tapping into peers. Okay, I think the mentor, let's say above you, if you want to visualize it, is is very important. If you can get it, it's hard. Not everybody can get that. Not everyone can afford it. Um, but here's you in the middle, just below the mentor. Go out laterally to your peers. Find people who are kind of at your stage of development, or if you can, a little bit beyond you or whatever, and be accountable with each other. Share where you screw up. Share what you're working on for the week, and r- do a weekly end wrap up. And and I mean, 
there are pe- and that's one of the biggest benefits of our community is what makes it very very special and what makes that type of peer communication very useful rather than just an anonymous chat room type environment is because the people speak nadro they may apply it a little bit differently, but they speak Nadro, and they can communicate with each other about what they were seeing and what they did, and they understand a whole lot about each other, so they can help each other a whole lot. If you're if you're trading Fibonacci retracements and you're talking to a moving average swing trader, and you're someone else is scalping order flow, yeah, you guys can you can still help each other. Okay, it's not a total lost cause, but you're never going to have the collaboration that you would if you didn't kind of get matched up there a little more. So find ways to get matched up with peers. There's all kinds of forums and and places. We have a great community if you're interested. All kinds of places to do that. Use your peers. Leverage your peers. Just because they don't have it all figured out doesn't mean you really can't help each other. And then the final one, someone below you, you do not have to have it all figured out to actually help someone who's six months behind you, who's one year behind you, on the learning curve that is, right? Give them a good book recommendation, right? Give them a good podcast recommendation. Um, Say these are some things, some paths I've gone down that were not fruitful. You know, use a network, find a community. I think that, like I said at the beginning of the talk, the greatest things on the planet just simply don't happen in isolation, especially when it comes to performance type type stuff. No, I think that's brilliant. I mean, I'm just sitting here and I'm thinking you're almost describing the law of attraction almost. Yeah. It's, there's so much going on sure, there. Sure, sure. You know, it's fantastic. And, uh, you know, I think I think you're going to knock Tom Canfield off the top with this podcast. <laughs> it, definitely, definitely. Sorry, Tom. He's, he's, he's going to kick your ass here. That was brilliant. <laughs> when we get a soundbite together, I don't know how I'm going to get all the soundbites into one minute at the beginning of this. Do like a but, like uh, an ESPN, like top 10. <laughs> little graphics. No, it's terrific. I mean, I, and, and hopefully I think our audience will get so much from that. I, I guess we should look at, at wrapping this up, Mark. I, I don't know what you're thinking. It's just, I mean, I could go on for hours just listening to Merritt and his wisdom. We're going to be inviting Merritt back again, I sense, right? He's, uh, he's the man that, that wins the flow from our audience point of view, but rightly so, you know, like I say. Um, some Some terrific things, some important things that stood out for me. You know, be unoriginal. You know, look at the edges that other people aren't looking at. Don't be the guy that gets looks at the stuff that everyone else does. Just be unoriginal. And, and the mimicry is, you know, in, in, in nature, it's important in terms of how we build things in, in, in our world to, to look at nature, but to, to look at trading and pick upon, you know, sort of proven models, but actually to maybe inherit them and play with them and put some of your own shapes around them. And of course, fit in your own risk parameters, right? And fit in, fit in you know, what, what's important for you. Um, because great things can come of that. I mean, I, there's lots of examples of, the, of, of models that are out there. Don't take them for what they are. Just use them as a way of learning and, and play with them. Uh, and of course... You know, Nadro will become embedded in the the, um, the history of podcasts as being as very very important. That five minute segment, people must listen to that if they're fresh to the market, just to understand the the level of curiosity we all we all need to have if we're going to be successful, really. And I think also this this sense that community and uh, and sharing and and teaching. Uh, um, being open and, and transparent about things is, is really to be encouraged. One of the most active parts of our community is what we call a, a journals section. And you, you start, a, it's like a forum, right? You start a thread um, and you make it your own, whether you just want to give updates, whether a lot of people post their daily preparation, they post their daily end of day reviews, they post their blotter with the trades that they took um, day after day. So imagine like the time, you know, you, you, you get back what you put into the world, right? So if you're sharing all that and, and, and opening the kimono in that way, imagine what someone is going to drop in, whether it's me or one of their peers, and say, wow, I'm noticing this. Here's some feedback. I mean, share more, you know. You, you don't have as many secrets as you, as you think you do. No, and it's good actually also to 
almost mentally rehash your own processes and actually put them down somewhere. For, because, of course, we can learn from that, even ourselves. Things become more obvious if we start to think in more detail. And I, and I suppose I, I want to end with this sort of summary in terms of it's important to actually not treat yourself so seriously. You know, and this concept of just having a bit of having fun, fitting fun somewhere into it is important. And some of the, the, the big, massive trading rooms I've worked in, the most successful had there was a bit of fun going on. There was an acceptance that you needed a bit of a social break. You know, that you needed to get the family together and have some fun fair thing at the weekend where the head of the business was getting on the Aunt Sally's store getting a sponge thrown at him by my eldest son and taken off of his chair. You know, those type of things make us laugh. And humour is the way of getting through some of this craziness of the markets. You know, laughing about things, laughing about laughing, laughing about yourself and your own mistakes mm-hmm. and, and not punishing yourself about them, but kind of, you know, laughing out loud about the things. Thinking, what have I learned from that? And, and, and move on from it, you know, let go of it. And, and yes, all those things, I think, have, have been embedded in, 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 in this, this great wisdom merit that you've shared in this this fantastic podcast so once again steve and i really really great and of course i think we're we're really wanting to know where people can find your stuff where should they look tell us more yeah definitely check out apteros trading.com a-p-t-e-r-o-s apteros trading.com you can find about the desk um education the tryout to become part of the desk it's it's pretty simple with not a, not a lot of uh, clutter, but a lot of really good things with our community and and what we're doing. Fantastic, and of course uh, you're on Twitter. Um, yep, Merit, Merit Black. Black. Two R's, two T's. <laughs> Remember that. Okay, this has been brilliant. Thank you so much, Merit. Again, it's been an absolute pleasure. It really has. Thank you for listening to this week's Alpha Mind podcast. If you have enjoyed this podcast or any of our past podcasts, we would be delighted if you could rate the podcast on whichever service you use or even better, leave a review. Thank you also to our podcast sponsor, the Society of Technical Analysts, the STA. You can go to technicalanalysts.com to find out more about their services and to explore becoming a member of the STA. As a reminder, at Alpha Mind, we focus on trader and investor personal growth and development. We offer coaching programs which are geared towards developing the key human personal and behavioral skills that are so vital in helping people grow their performance and take their trading or investing to a higher level. Our clients come from a range of backgrounds from across the world. These include leading portfolio managers working at some of the world's largest hedge funds, asset management firms and sovereign wealth funds. We also work with investment banks and some of the world's largest commodity and energy trading businesses. Our clients also come from a myriad of other backgrounds, including family offices, proprietary trading firms, firms, as well as many serious private retail traders. In addition to trade and investor coaching, our services extend to executive, leadership and team coaching with a specialist focus on financial markets, investment and risk businesses. To know more about our services, visit our webpage alpha-mind.net or email us info at alpha-mind.net or visit the Alpha Mind blog page for more contact information. If you would like to sign up for our regular newsletter, you can do so on the page link at the top of the Alpha Mind blog and you can also listen to our podcasts on our new Alpha Mind YouTube channel. Finally, you can follow us and connect with us on social media. We are active on LinkedIn in our own names, Stephen Goldstein and Mark Randall, or through the Alpha Mind group on LinkedIn, which is over 15,000 members. You can also follow us on Twitter. Our handles are Alpha Mind 101 and Alpha Mind 102. We wish you well, stay safe and have a great week.